International Affairs at the Elliott School of International Affairs, and I'm hosting today's conversation. You're all very welcome. Um, before we begin, rather informally, I'm wearing green in honour of St. Patrick's Day, which is a national holiday here in Ireland. Um, so I just want to give a big shout out um, for St. Patrick's Day to everyone across the world who will be celebrating not only Irish people, but just about everybody. In fact, a, a, a little quirky point I heard today was that a third of the population of Australia have Irish roots. So who knew? Maybe everybody knew, but I just found that out today. So interesting, perhaps. Anyway, in terms of um, our conversation today, we have a wonderful lineup of experts on this topic. And it is my great privilege to introduce you to each of those in a moment and to hear their, about their research and their work on this particular topic. Um, I think it might be helpful as well for us to think about the topic and frame it within the broader women, peace and security agenda or framework coming out of UN Security Council Resolution 1325 and its nine sister resolutions, which make up that particular framework. And as, as I'm sure we're all very aware, um, the focus within that framework is women's participation in all aspects of conflict resolution, peace and security processes, the protection of women and girls' human rights and protection from violence, and also women's inclusion in the prevention of conflict and extremism globally. And so I think the topic that we're discussing today very much fits within that framework and the issues that uh, we are all focused on um, within this sector. In particular, it's interesting to, to draw attention to the UN Secretary General's report of 2019 on the Women, Peace and Security agenda, talking about how 102 women had been killed in the previous four years and in 26 conflict affected states. These women were journalists, activists, human rights defenders, and women politicians, and likely the number is undercounted. Um, the Secretary General in that particular report um, linked these killings with misogynistic hate and sexist speech by political leaders, and um, really calling on um, all um, UN member states um, to work together on um, ending violence against women and girls. So today we're going to be looking at the role of online platforms and how they perpetuate um, extremism and violence against women and girls um, and women politicians in particular. And I'm now going to just briefly, very briefly, because each of our um, participants have very extensive biographies. So we're gonna put the biographies in the chat for you, for you to have a look at in more detail. And I'm now just going to give you a brief introduction. So first of all, um, I would like to introduce you to Pumzila Van Dam, who was a member of the South African parliament and is also the Shadow Communications Minister and a member of the Democratic Alliance Party. She has dedicated her career to fighting corruption and protecting public interest. Pumzila's previous positions include National Spokesperson for the Democratic Alliance, the Head of Parliamentary Research and Communications, and Spokesperson for the Ministry of Finance, Economic Development and Tourism. She has been named one of Forbes' top oh, I see 20 they're bigger than young your other ones. power I think women. They don't make smaller ones. The Mail and The Guardian newspapers top 200 South Africans and has participated in the International Visitor Leadership Program by U.S. Department of State on political campaigns. Pumzila, you're very welcome. Thank you for joining us here today. I'd like, now like to share um, a little about Emma Ruby Sachs, who is the executive, executive director of Some of Us, a global movement of over 15 million members committed to curbing the growing power of corporations. The Some of Us community works to defend democracies around the world from the threat of disinformation on global tech platforms, such as Facebook, YouTube, and Google. 
She is also an author and her writing includes a, a literary novel titled The Water Man's Daughter. Her writing has also been published in The Guardian, The Nation and The Huffington Post. And she was previously the de deputy director of Avaz and practiced constitutional appellate law. And I'd also like to introduce you to then Maureen Sanda Rajan, who is a Dalit American artist, technologist, and the executive director of Equality Labs, an art and technology startup supporting South Asian religious, cultural, and genderqueer communities in the US and South Asia. Through her work, she organizes communities to fight impunity um, state violence, anti-blackness, caste apartheid, and religious intolerance. And her work has been recognized by the Robert Rauschenberg Foundation, Producers Guild of America Diversity Program, and the Museum of Contemporary Art and Magnum Foundation. You're very welcome. And now to move on to Shay Akiwowo, who is the founder and executive director of Glitch, a UK charity dedicated to ending online abuse and champion, championing digital citizenship. In 2020, George Washington University appointed her Knight Fellow of the Institute for Data, Democracy and Politics. Glitch's achievements have been acknowledged in the UK Parliament and Shay has been shortlisted as Digital Leader of the Year finalist and Stylist Magazine's Woman of the Week as well as Amnesty International's Human Rights Defender. She, is also, um, she has also presented at the United Nations Human Rights Council on the issue of online gender-based violence, as well as the Ad Hoc Committee on the Elaboration of Complementary Standards to discuss how to update the Convention on Racial Discrimination to include online abuse. You're very welcome, Shay. And now, um, finally, to Christina Wilford who is an international political consultant um, helping to increase people's participation in parties, politics and parliament through the use of grassroots tools for advocacy, innovative campaign approaches and leadership development. She works with political leaders and NGOs throughout Europe, the US, Africa and the Middle East. Christina has worked with change agents in over 25 countries, including Ukraine, Syria, Turkey, Kenya, and Afghanistan, implementing large-scale democracy programs, working against authoritarian governments, and strengthening civil society organizations. And just to say that Christina is also the director of the Global Gender Policy Capstone at George Washington University, where we are colleagues. So I want to thank you all for joining us here today for this very important discussion. And I'm going to kick off um, our conversation by asking Christina to explain a little bit about the difference between online violence against women um, and what has recently been termed as gendered disinformation. And just to share a little bit more about what, how, why that matters and to tell us about her work specifically linking big tech authoritarianism and misogyny. Thank you, Shirley, and thank you, everyone. It's, it's an honor to be on this panel and be in this discussion with you in the context of the UN CSW. So, so let me start by saying, you know, I, I am a democracy activist at heart, and you know, I focus on the issues where I, I see the biggest threats and biggest opportunities. And the more I started to dig into the reality of disinformation and how it was aimed uh, to silence the participation. Uh, an ascension of women in politics, the more concerned I became and started doing a series of projects around this and digging further to better understand what is the relationship between disinformation and gender and women's political participation. And when I started to really look at the body of evidence that is growing, but not enough, um, a very dangerous picture is emerging. So we have a high level of evidence now that shows that women politicians globally 
are facing a deluge of gender-based attacks online, mixing weaponized hate and disinformation with the anonymity provided by the social media platforms themselves. And the aim is really to destroy the reputation of women and push them out of public life. Uh, and women of color in particular, uh, and those of religious minorities are even at greater risk of becoming targets of such attacks. So traditionally, this is seen as the violence against women in elections um, work that many in the NGO and international development space have innovated and been early adopters to identify. But today we need to modernize our examination of the problem to correspond to the way that these attacks are weaponized against women for political gain and really for the purpose of undermining democracy itself. So the new elements here, which little attention has been paid to, is the actual role of digital platforms themselves. So we have this intersection of misogyny and the way that it fuels or is part of the strategy of misinformation, and then the way that it's dovetailing with violent extremism in the online world, and we certainly saw that play out. Um, in January 6th insurrection in the US, but it's been playing out in many different contexts around the world. So we're trying to move this conversation to make more clear to stakeholders outside of the women's community that this is a priority to address for securing women's rights and also a key foreign policy and national security imperative for every country that espouses democratic values of leadership. Um, so when we alter, you know, this language and broaden the stakeholders, we can really see that there's something much more dangerous that's going on. The tools in the hands of authoritarians are being used to undermine the participation of women journalists, whether it's Maria Reza in the Philippines or candidates, as we saw in Vice President Harris's campaign, you know, itself in the way that disinformation through the use of technology was really an attack system at scale in order to undermine the credibility of these women, their participation in public life. And it's not even those who are high profile. We can look to Georgia and the way that largely black women were doxxed and attacked as volunteer poll workers in participating in administering the election became caught up in this uh, scheme to you know, focus on their role in, in administering the election. So we're really seeing it broaden and deepen and the, the women who are caught into this net are, are even, you know, it's even a more dangerous situation in the administering of elections themselves. So what we're bringing in both our research and attention to this issue is a different way of thinking about the stakes of what we're facing and who is best positioned to resolve this. So we are unfortunately not going to be able to make huge headway in fighting misogyny in the world. We need probably 400 more years, but what we should be fighting is the way that the tools and technology allows this system to come to scale and the role and responsibility of the products that big tech is putting out into the world that are causing harm in society. So that conversation is unique. I believe it's the first time we're actually addressing it in this manner in the context of UN. And it's really where we need to continue having the conversation, especially as efforts are underway to pull into the conversation the role of digital platforms and the policy agendas around the world that are trying to improve the situation. So we have lots of new stakeholders to bring into this conversation and new uh, front lines for action and opportunities to change the situation when we sort of slightly tweak the way we look at root causes um, rather than just managing the fallout. Thank you, Christina. I'm now going to follow up on those points by asking Pumzilla to come in and talk a little bit about the work that she's doing with Facebook um, and how the South African Parliament um, Committee of Communications and Digital Technologies has invited um, Facebook to respond to questions about misinformation on its platform during the local elections there. Pumzilla, could you talk to us a little bit to that particular issue? 
Sure. Um, just to speak to the topic at hand, I mean, I'm a young female politician, a, a black female politician, and I have certainly felt the brunt of um, sexualized disinformation in the social media space from bot attacks to general disinformation campaigns. And the way that I have dealt with it is by simply standing my ground, which is, um, you know, already in a space where being a female politician is already tough. But on, on, on the online space, I've made sure I've stood my ground um, and my voice was not silenced. Um, but in terms of Facebook, um, you know, it's really difficult to, for us as women to do the work um, and try spread awareness and try educating people about disinformation, misinformation, the right terminology, how to identify it. If we do not deal with the big tech companies where this sort of thing happens, um, as we know, the algorithm is targeted towards, you know, misinformation, which is what uh, generates um, engagement. It's the algorithm. It's the fact that they use more AI moderation and, and, and not uh, more human moderators where nuance can be picked up. So um, I kind of set the agenda for 2021 in South Africa to focus on big tech and to sp focus specifically on misinformation, which isn't entirely uncharted territory in South Africa. I think a lot of people are aware of it, but not in the government space. So I'd suggested we invite Facebook. Um, and I think we're the first African country to do so. So the aim for us is not as the US does, you know, where Mark Zuckerberg is held accountable in terms of the algorithm and how they monitor misinformation, but ours is more targeted towards an election that will happen later this year. And we would like a very specific plan regarding what steps they will be taking in South Africa um, related to fighting misinformation. Um, and a lot of it is, you know, South Africa is a country that comes from an apartheid past. So a lot of the misinformation is race related. It is a xenophobic. Um, so the point really is to just sort of begin a conversation with big tech. Um, this is just the first one. We intend to speak to Twitter and we just generally want to start speaking to a lot of a lot of, of the tech companies. And I would really encourage that there be greater support from the UN from for what is a global movement um, that is targeted at making sure that big tech changes its model of operation where you know profit is not sought from spreading misinformation through the algorithm um, to sell advertising, but one where, you know, Facebook makes a lot of money. They don't need to make even more money. And um, so I think there needs to be greater support from the UN regarding the fight against misinformation. Um, you know, it's been identified as the number one global threat. I think there's many kind of discussions that need to be had. Um, I read an article in Political, where Kathleen Johnson, um, the founder, co-founder of factchecked.org, spoke about changing the terminology and talking about uh, viral deception, which I think is a great idea because the word fake news has sort of become as an identification of anything that I don't agree with, and misinformation and disinformation, a bit more technical terms that we understand, but. Uh, you know, the rest of the populace might not. So I think it's the start of an important conversation. Um, and I would, for myself, and I think from a lot of activists in the sector would like to see it becoming more of a central discussion. And particularly as women and women politicians, women activists, women in high profile positions are subjected, um, are, you know, the main, victims of, of, of uh, gendered disinformation. Thank you, Pamzela. 
I'm now going to turn to Tenmori and just invite you, Tenmori, if you could just share with us some of the developments in the Global South for women and how the impact of disinformation campaigns can inflame ethnic tensions and also, you know, how your role as a digital investigator and activist, you know, how you think that we need to um, really influence international advocacy on these particular issues. Sure, thank you so much, um, Shirley, for that. And thank you for all of our previous panelists for kind of laying the groundwork. Um, I think what's so important for people that are watching from home and really grappling with this issue about how disinformation is a gendered issue is that I think we need to keep in mind first, particularly with these American big tech companies, the way that they were deployed in the global South was in a very colonial way. They actually launched into these democracies without human rights impact rights assessments, without any sort of cultural competencies related to language or, um, you know, caste or gender or religious difference. And they just went in to seize the entire market. And if you, if you think about like how Facebook started, Facebook was started by um, people who were in Harvard who wanted to try to find hot chicks. That is not the cultural competency needed for global civic discourse, let alone for emerging democracies, particularly ones that are shaped by like as, you know, Fumzila spoke about by apartheid. You know, in our context in India, we're dealing with caste apartheid and we have many other similar fractured democracies that have really been brought to the edge of chaos by companies that willfully went into these company um, countries failed their duty of care to serve all users and have created um, messes of all of the, um, the processes internally to um, democracy. And I think what's really important, and in our work, we do a lot of disinformation and um, uh, cyber forensics in South Asia. One of the things that we've seen is that the model of how they engage with our company, uh, countries is colonial, but we actually have the user power. Because when you talk about who the next billion users are, it's not in Europe, it's not in the United States, it is the global south. In fact, India is the largest market for Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, you name it, they want us because they can't have China. So even though we have the user leverage, even though um, we actually represent the future of their profit margins. They're literally not looking at the fact that they've brought our countries to the edge of disaster. And, and I think that, you know, for gender-based advocates who've been working around online hate, women were actually the first canaries in the coal mine because all of these democracies that have been put into crisis were put into crisis by autocrats, many of whom whose bread and butter is misogyny. And, and and so like whether we're talking about um, Modi in India or Abe in Japan or Bolsonaro in Brazil, the, the normalization that we experienced about violence against women actually led the path towards disinformation. And in India, one of the biz, biggest examples of that is this hashtag called prostitute. Um, which I'm sure as many people have heard around the world, it's a portmanteau of prostitute and press. And it was one of the first hashtags that came out of India that went global. And in fact, was now used by right-wing movements all over the world. In fact, Maria Ressa was saying she learned about prostitute because it was used between trolls in the Philippines and in India. So when women journalists get called prostitutes or the field of journalism as a whole is called prostitutes, the idea is, is that the guardians, the people of who are creating facts are not able to be treated as uh, respectable sectors of, um, of fact keeping. They are actually immediately, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm hearing another sound in there. Is there someone? I just want to ask everybody if they could mute because we can hear a little bit of background noise. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Shirley. So I think that what's so challenging about that hashtag was not only did it continue unabated and it was used to harass journalists, it also led to the murder of journalists. 
and a silencing factor in terms of the checks that could occur related to disinformation. So I think that the line between what we see as gender-based violence online and disinformation that under, undermines democracy is not a line at all. It's actually the continuum of the failure of duty of care that these corporations are doing in our countries. And the last point that, uh, that I really wanna leave people with in terms of considering what should be done is that you know, in many ways, these companies like colonial administrations, they have a very narrow funnel within how they want to uh, deal with these problems. So you're expected like you know, what Mozilla what was sharing in terms of what she experienced, if you're lucky to have access, you can maybe raise your one individual issue. Maybe that one handle can get protected. Maybe that one instance of violence is gonna be addressed. But the structural problem remains, bias in the platform, lack of cultural competencies, and very clearly in so many of our vulnerable democracies, there is no protocol for mass atrocity. And that becomes very serious when we look at the coup in Myanmar, when we look at the conditions in India, where India is in a genocidal crisis, it's shocking to me that none of the major big tech companies have a transparent plan related to genocide. They have no conversation about what are the, the who are, who, how are they going to be transparent about any of the moderation calls if a pogrom occurs? What are the protections available for human rights defenders in um, grave crises like that? And also who are the dangerous actors that they're naming for each market? And that question of who gets to be seen as a dangerous actor is very critical for feminists to consider, because right now the only people who get to weigh in on those conversations are the state. But let's look at what's happening in Pakistan right now, where many of the organizers of the Women's March are actually being um, laid uh, for, um, laid, you know, being publicly charged with charges of blasphemy simply for marching for women's rights. So if the state is going to determine who is a, a terrorist actor, it's very dangerous for women and other human rights defenders who don't have the same play into what gets determined as harassment and violence and disinformation on the platform. So the key here that I really want to leave folks here is that the burden of so much of this organizing often falls onto feminist movements. And I think what we need to do is to turn that burden right back on the companies because they're the ones making the money off of our violence. They're the ones profiting off of genocide. And we need to stop doing their work and hold them accountable through regulation, through public campaigning and demand more. There's no way that we are gonna solve this through, through one person, one department, one post. There is a structural failure in the duty of care and the protection of all of our all of our democracies, and we need to act in a unified way to be able to address that. Thank you so much for that. And I, I think um, there's so much that we're going to tease out around all of those points that you have raised um, and that our other panelists have raised so far further on in this discussion and hopefully in our um, Q&A as well. But I think this is a good time to bring Emma in and to share with us the work that you are doing really to put pressure on um, governments and to really um, bring in those um, levers of change through the work that you are doing. Emma, can you tell us a bit more about your campaigns and how you are exerting that pressure? Yeah, I'd love to. I have two response things I'm going to say. I'm hijacking completely, Shirley. I'm sorry, but I'll keep them really brief. Um, and the first one is just when we talk about this gender based analysis, I think like anything, what we see is that the ills that we're facing are just in the extreme when it comes to a gender based analysis. So if you yell something misogynist and you yell something that is about promoting equity, the misogynist content will travel much faster and create its own networks. And we just, to solve this problem is, a, we are we are looking at it through a gendered lens today, um, but it's fundamental to all of the problems that we face. And that's why I think this conversation is so essential to see that intersectionality. Um, and then the second just point about the UN and, and being in this space, what it means today to be in a UN space. Um, and I'm so rarely in this kind of space. I'm very often dealing with this on a national, regional basis. Um, is 
because Facebook is making these individual deals all the time. They used to say, we can't do anything about this. We can't solve these problems. But in fact, what they've done is they've gone country to country and said, okay, we've got a special little treat for you. We're gonna go and give you this election protection. Um, we're gonna make sure we pass these laws in the US and they're only gonna to apply to English speakers in the US. We're gonna forget about Spanish speakers. Um, we're gonna give France this Mercedes Benz of election protection, but I don't know what they're gonna offer South Africa and if they're gonna offer the same thing. And one of the roles the United Nations can play is setting those international standards and making sure that those countries with less negotiation leverage or with governments that aren't as invested in negotiating for these protections, that they're not left alone and those people in those countries are not left alone. So when we're talking about how we negotiate with Facebook, if we talk about Facebook standards, especially in election protection from a UN perspective, we may be able to start lifting the game so that countries in the global south, for example, get the French treatment and they're not left to negotiate or Spanish speakers in the US get the French treatment and they're not, not left out in the cold to be subject to misogynist, brutal misinformation that decreases their participation in elections. So those are my two hijack things. But um, I know that my role here is to talk a little bit about the fact that there is an amazing global movement fighting against uh, a lot of these ills. Um, and it starts from the assumption that these platforms cannot regulate themselves, that these conversations, while I recognize we have to have them, that these platforms are fruitless and have been for years. Uh, I just saw an article today that said that Facebook and Twitter and Google have made in the last 18 months, 300 policy changes that made almost zero difference to the spread of harmful disinformation. So we start from that premise um, that they are not gonna voluntarily do anything to solve this problem. And then there's a number of regulatory measures that are in place um, that are moving through different processes. The most robust is coming through the European Union. And one of the things that the global community can do is to recognize that as the European Union considers what this regulatory framework might look like, making sure there's a strong international voice, and that's partly our job of people, saying we need these regulations, we need them to be robust, we need them to be comprehensive. They can't just be about Facebook. They have to be about how this new architecture of human connection is dealt with. How is, how is it made to flourish? How does it support our interactions as human beings across boundaries and borders and not destroy the systems of participation in democracy that we've already worked so hard to set up. Um, and so there's, there's a really important regulatory process happening there. That conversation, we hope, will start to inform the regulatory process that will happen in the US in the coming years, um, where there's also a strong voice talking about the harms and considering what comprehensive legislation could look like there. Uh, and then there's piecemeal conversations happening in other parts of the world. India um, actually is sort of engaging in the regulatory conversation in a very piecemeal way. Um, and we're one of the first movers way back when, when the WhatsApp uh, murders happened. Um, so there's this robust regulatory movement. And then there's this amazing employee movement. A lot of these tech companies, I think, made a mistake in hiring a bunch of progressive people on the theory that these companies were progressive companies. And so you see these wonderful employee movements cropping up saying, you know, we don't want our tools being used to promote racist values. We don't want Donald Trump on Twitter. Um, and providing almost, if you think of these companies as um, major international actors like countries, these employees are like citizens who are organizing and raising their voice. Um, and because they are so highly skilled and because they do share a lot of our values, they are shifting the ball a little bit within the companies, which is a really valuable thing. And part of my job is to help support that and help make sure our members are connecting with those employees and giving them the backing of an international community that's deeply concerned about this. Um, and then advertisers, it's really bad for their brands to be associated with some of the crap that's all over the internet. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that word actually, sorry, but there it is. Um, and so looking at advertiser associations, looking at coalitions like Stop Hate for Profit and how they're raising awareness about the fact that, that the market that these companies depend on for their survival, the attention market and the advertising market, that that market is soft. That when you're facing regulation from one side and you're facing your market targets, unhappiness on the other, your business model starts to become very uh, insecure. And that's that kind of, uh, combination this is very uh, fruitful for change. We saw that in the climate movement where um, 
We saw that there were employees who weren't feeling great about what their companies were doing and there was regulation that was softening their market. And then there was divestment movements that were softening their market. And then there was a broad based citizen movement calling for change in the sector. And that combination, as well as really robust UN involvement in the conversation of what those international standards should be, started to shift the conversation. And it started to shift the markets and eventually st it's starting to shift the harms to our planet. Um, and that's the kind of movement we're building today on big tech. Thank you, Emma. And um, I suppose I'd just like to maybe um, pose some questions back to the entire panel now, just kind of pulling together some of the issues that we've been highlighting. And I know we're due to have another speaker join us as well. And as soon as she comes online, I will um, create an opportunity for her to share her remarks. Um, but I'm just interested in your thoughts on, you know, how can we, you know, help or, you know, really push the UN itself to focus on this whole topic of gender disinformation? What more can be done? And also, what do we need to look out for in terms of the platforms themselves and not taking responsibility on the issues we've been highlighting? You know, what are some of the, you know, ways that that is happening that we need to be continuing to pay attention to and highlighting within forums like, like this one here? So um, if anybody would like to share any thoughts, perhaps Christina? Sure. And I have been dropping in the chat a bunch of different resources. And, you know, while we can, from an academic viewpoint, from a researcher, digital forensic, certainly learn more about this topic, there is a lot of data already, right? So if we are having conversations with the platforms and their responses, you know, will show us the evidence. What is it exactly that you're, you're pointing to? We can show the evidence trail at this point. Um, one of the levers of influence is to expose that and have these private conversations with the platforms be in fact public, which is what Representative Jackie Speer did last year in US Congress uh, by issuing a public letter outlining the problem and risk of gender disinformation, especially in light of the US election. But this was also signed on by 100 lawmakers from 30 countries who can also verify uh, about the nature of the problem in their countries. And so what we really need to do at this point is move these one-on-one -on -one private conversations where promises are made by the platforms into a public dialogue that is meant to create conditions for more accountability and change. And that should be a role that everyone takes some mandate or a piece of you know action to do so whether if you are a candidate an elected official an activist to document speak out about the nature of this of these threats if you are a policymaker you know there is no one silver bullet reform but there are many important reforms moving forward in various parliaments that we need to support learn from and amplify and if you're a journalist, you know, we have a lot to do to educate media about how to report responsibly on this. And one of the guides that was developed out of the Women's Disinformation Defense uh, Project in the US last year to really look at the gender disinformation aimed against Vice President Harris was to also educate media that when we even talk about the attack lines and the nature of the attack lines and that's the news story we are carrying those damaging narratives forward and that we're giving life to those accusations so media has an increased role also in reporting responsibly around this topic um this is then Mori. and i think building off of what christina was saying is that the role that the UN plays is that I think that um, the way that these companies work, um, uh, they basically split apart advocacy by region um, and also by country so that they create uneven implementations of their community guidelines based on how much they value the proximity to the ruling party in power. 
And, um, and when you talk to them, you know, they have asinine reasons for doing this. There's nothing that they say. I oftentimes think of when I'm talking with the companies, I just hear blah, 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 money, 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 blah, 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 blah. So I, and I, and I'm saying that practically because they're like, what Christina was saying is absolutely right, which is that, you know, they're, they're, they don't need data from civil society. They actually need nothing from civil society to change everything that they need to do to address gender disinformation. They just, it's not just, it's just not profitable for them to do it because some of the biggest influencers on their platforms are misogynists who are destroying democracies. That's the bottom line. It makes them a ton of money. They're not interested in shutting them down. So I think we have to take this as a serious problem of a global stakeholder because all these companies are global stakeholders. They often are um, entities that have laws unto themselves and supersede laws in different markets um, uh, because of how they operate. And so I think the UN, because of its many um, uh, covenants that exist there, there could be some uh, reigning in uh, on a global level, particularly if we're talking about what are the standards for election observation? What are the standards for mass atrocity and genocide? And begin to look at practical manifestations of how that would look in a social media context. For example, if we have people who are poll observers in the physical landscape of an elections process, why don't we have international observers in the moderation rooms where they're making critical calls related to campaign content. That should be transparent as a way to protect democracy, particularly in many of these offices in um, democracies have complicit actors with, with anti-democratic actors who are staffed as the company representatives. We would not be able to know that information unless we have third party observation. Why do we have American companies operating as critical stakeholders in global elections without any oversight. That's bananas. Why would we do that? Why would any, why would any country allow that, first of all? Then knowing Mark Zuckerberg, why would you allow him in your democracy without any oversight, right? So I think the fact that it was technology, it was really a Trojan horse that many countries let in because the technology outpaced the policy. It, out, it, out, it also outpaced our larger civic understanding within many countries about what's possible and our rights. And I, I remember very early on going to a conference called RightsCon and um, uh, seeing, um, you know, David Kay, the former rapporteur on freedom of expression speak, and he was saying, you know, users, you know, as, as, as someone who's on these platforms, you have rights as a user and rights as a citizen. And the thing that blew me away is, do I have more power as a user of a platform or as a citizen of a democracy? And the fact that a lot of people can't answer that question for their country context is the problem. And so I think if we're concerned about women's representations, women's power overall in society, we cannot ignore disinformation and gender disinformation because it is a critical barrier for us to be able to have access to power in our countries. And the only way for us to get it back is to hold these companies feet to the fire and demand regulation, transparency, and a, a rebalancing of who gets to be stakeholders in this process where global South advocates get to drive the conversations because some, some dynamics are too hard to change in the first world, but in the global South, we're not fully penetrated yet from these companies. There's still a chance to fight. And I think that's why we need to be able to have a global conversation about how do we hold these companies accountable now before it's too late. Yeah, just to build on that, um, for me, I see gender, dis gender dis disinformation as part of a greater problem. Um, so what we need to deal with is disinformation, just as a concept. Um, and holding platforms accountable is important. Um, so we just pick up on the point Emma made earlier on. Um, regarding African countries and maybe countries in the global South, while we may not have as great a influence on policies um, like the US and the EU has, 
I do think we have a bit more agency. Um, I don't know if you know about the Bell Pottinger saga, but it was um, a global PR firm. They had contracts with the Pentagon, um, with various dictators across the world. And um, they ran a campaign in South Africa, which sought to you know, use the racial differences um, in South Africa to basically create lagers. Um, and yeah, and they played a key role in bringing Bell Pottinger down and, you know, they shot shop. So what I think instead, because Facebook has basically indicated that they are focusing more of their business in the global south, um, what is needed is less of an approach where, you know, because Africans, uh, at least when we speak from the African perspective, are very kind of against what they will view as Western interference. Um, and they're less likely to kind of agree or you know, be assisted in you know, pointing out that this is a problem that you have in the democracy, particularly in autocratic states where you know, disinformation benefits uh, whichever party or dictator is in power. I think it is more of an advocacy process where you sensitize um, opposition parties or you sensitize um, communities, individuals of the dangers of, of misinformation. Um, and it also just has to do with a cultural change um, in the way that women are perceived. Um, so it, I think it's a really, really tall task um, because when people share that type of thing, they think it's okay, you know, women are inferior. So it's it's kind of a multi-pronged okay. approach um, that one tackles disinformation, just generally disinformation. And then secondly, then goes into specifically targeting um, gender disinformation, disinformation and a pro program of awareness um, because I don't people think people truly understand the danger. You know, they still refer to it as fake news and all these terms that we use are not necessarily um, understood. So I really think it requires a public education uh, campaign um, tailored for different audiences. Um, not only just tackling gender, dis gender disinformation, but also just generally, you know, patriarchy, misogyny. Um, I think it needs to be multi-pronged because you can tackle gendered misinformation, but people, if people still hold those views, then, you know, you are pissing in the wind. Um, so I, I see it as a problem that really requires the best brains to come around and sit around the table and come up with ideas. What I, body that I am on is the Grand Committee on um, uh, Disinformation, which is, we sent that letter to Facebook um, about gender disinformation. Um, and I think th th that's also an important platform where, at least from my side, um, I will continue raising that because we can send letters, there can be advocacy, there can be all of this. But if we don't tackle the platforms themselves um, in, as in legislatures like we're doing, um, you know, and there's not just a small group of, you know, experts um, in tech, but greater grassroots involvement um, of individuals who say, you know, we're going to stop using Facebook um, if you don't fix this. I think as soon as it starts affecting the bottom line, the engagement rates, because people realize that they're in the space where they're being deceived um, and money is being made from them being deceived, I think then we'll have a far greater response. So as I see it, in summary, politicians can belong to it. Uh, as I see it, it's about tackling disinformation. Um, it's about a global campaign about gender disinformation, but also just generally about gender equality. It's about um, sensitizing the populace about disinformation, or rather 
viral deception, which is the term I'm going to use now. Um, and I, I don't think it's a thing that can be solved um, by any one kind of individual actor, but the UN, I think, needs to take it far more seriously than it is. I mean, it's a threat to women's lives. It's a threat to democracy. It's a threat. It's creating a, a very polarized world. Um, and yeah, it requires far more attention and holding those companies um, accountable. Um, I would like to see, you know, the UN call Facebook, call Mark Zuckerberg, call Jack Dorsey, um, you know, and have those discussions and not behind the doors discussions, but public discussions where, you know, we can watch uh, the questions being asked and see that this is an issue that's being taken seriously. So, you know, it's always about, it's always women who sit around the table and talk about women's issues. Um, men need to start taking it seriously too. Um, and yeah, I could speak on and on about this. It's something I'm very passionate about, but yeah, you can't just us being women and talking about it. Men need to, need to come to the table um, and also, you know, raise the alarm. Muted. Thank you, Pramzilla. And I think this is an opportunity now to invite all of our participants um, in this event to, if you wish to put questions into the chat box, and we'll be coming to those in a moment, um, uh, creating an opportunity for you to have dialogue with our panelists, obviously. But I see that we have now been joined by Shei Aki Wowo, and um, I'm delighted that you're here. And I think this is a really good moment, actually, Shay, for you to come into the conversation and just remind everybody that Shay is founder of Glitch, which is a UK charity dedicated to ending online abuse and championing digital citizenship. So with that in mind, Shay, I wondered if you could talk a bit to how we can enhance digital citizenship. Um, especially the mechanisms that demand safe online spaces, obviously, particularly for women, that's what we're talking about, and also particularly women of colour. So if you could tell us a bit more about your work, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I know people probably say this at the beginning as a kind of cheesy introduction, but I've genuinely had a lot of fun at, at CSW this year around really um, a lot a, a lot more kind of radical disruptive conversations um, about tech. And I'm, and I'm really pleased because uh, we don't get to have that a lot in the UK. Um, so I'm Shay, I'm the CEO of Glitch. I call myself an accidental CEO um, because I never planned to be a CEO. I plan to be um, married to Idris Elba by the time I'm 30, not managing a not-for-profit to try to get tech bros to take gender-based violence seriously. The reason why I accidentally became a CEO was because somebody decided to put a video of a speech that I made about reparations and racial justice online on a neo-Nazi neo website and I was on the receiving end of trolling and abuse as a local woman in politics. And you can imagine trying to navigate the system of tech companies and reporting, which was very basically no system and then trying to get access to justice as a black woman and the constant re-traumatizing made me think that actually this is something that needs to be fixed so maybe I need to be Sally the one that does it we can have a conversation in 10 or 15 years time about why we always need black women to come and solve the issues of white men but that's not what a conversation is today what the conversation is around what digital citizenship is right and digital citizenship for us is about understanding what our rights and responsibilities are online and understanding that we've got digital rights and making sure that everybody has those across the world and making sure we're really clear about what our individual social and institutions responsibilities are when it comes to the online space conversations around social norms although we i'll get onto it in a moment they, they still need to be had. Um, social norms have been, dis have been discussed and have been decided and have been have, have, have changed and evolved offline, but yet we've not even begun to start about start that online. 
we haven't begun to start about start the conversation around online efficacy and around what it looks like to be an active bystander online when you witness abuse online. So there's a huge deficit in uh, understanding our responsibilities of tech companies. And do you know what also is that deficit here? Our, our, our understanding around um, how we can hold tech companies accountable. At Glitch, we've said that this is now the decade. The next 10 years is around tech accountability. And digital citizenship has to be about everyday users and consumers understanding that they can hold tech companies to account. And it's not just Mark Zuckerberg and Jack Dorsey, because the problem is that we only focus on those two yes, problematic platforms, meaning that we forget about the second generation platforms that are emerging, like TikTok, like Clubhouse. What we're seeing now is a, is a race to the bottom in terms of tech being designed and being developed. We are seeing minimal content moderations. We've spent 10 years asking Twitter to get better content moderation policies and Clubhouse has come up out of the blue, out of nowhere, and has less content moderation policies than Twitter. So when we're talking about tech accountability, we have to say across the board otherwise accounts like sorry companies like bing which when you put in the word jew 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 jewish or jew jew uh jews lie about holocaust comes up and all sorts of anti-semitic points come up on bing because all of our attention has been on google um digital citizenship also has to evolve around what it looks like what it what sorry digital citizenship also has to evolve to include online safety we have to do it though in a prism in a prism that does not to reproduce victim blaming language and i and i'd like to think, say that glitch has done a good job at that we call our online safety workshops digital digital self-care and self-defense we provide online free online trainings we've got no no choice but to provide online trainings we're in a pandemic but we provide free online online training once every quarter for women to understand the platform settings, how to feel safe and confident, and we, we, we target particularly women of minoritized communities and women who want to stand in public life, whether that's journalism, sports, um, politics, so that they don't feel like this is yet another barrier to take up space online. Um, another role that we try and do as well in those workshops is to kind of start getting them to see that you can hold these tech companies to account, that it isn't acceptable. We can challenge the culture of victim blaming language, and I think um, We've seen, particularly in the UK, and I'm, I'm sure you've got to have heard, heard the stories of Sarah Everard. We've been we've been seeing yet again victim blaming language. She was just walking home. It's not all men. We have that when it comes to online abuse and harassment every single day. So digital citizenship education really has to be about um, challenging our language, not calling it online versus the real world or the um, online versus uh, so fake word versus the real real world or in real life attacks. Attacks online are very much real and have psychological impact and finally digital citizenship has to be about what it means to be an active bystander online particularly those that hold privilege on the online space and privilege means high follower counts also being a white woman and a white man um, um and being straight right these are these are privileges that are, are afforded on the online space how do we get those to understand what it means to safely intervene and tell your tell your counterpart tell your counterpart or somebody from your community that this is not the way to address a black woman or an Asian woman um, or, to, or, or to stop the conversation being derailed, which is a tactic of a troll um, to derail the conversation. So I think digital citizenship education is the key to us beginning to start having a global conversation around the solutions and around the standards in which we want to, um, to hold tech companies to account. I've made notes of a couple other things that I'd like to say. They might not be structured, but I think it's really important to say. I think the the, the first thing here is um, someone said it before on the panel around um, the global south has still such an opportunity to not repeat the, the mistakes and the issues that we have in the in in the west and in the UK and in Europe and but, but my real fear is that we've got well intended well meaning sometimes international communities providing broadband providing laptops providing um, um, uh, mobile phones which have only CNN, Facebook, and the the charities um, website. So even that's a little bit um, strange for me that we're we're opening up more people in the global south to, to CNN, which is a very right wing station. Um, uh, we, yet yeah, we're providing phones to to communities in the global south without any digital citizenship education, without any safety training for the individual, but also their community. What we have started to hear from the ground is that women 
in the global south have these phones are now kind of adored and, and have a kind of higher status and are being forced to take photos of themselves and put it online to earn money so we're not we're giving women these tools to be on the on online space which is important their digital right but we're not giving them any equipping them of any kind of knowledge and skills and power to, to say no and 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 enforce their own boundaries so that's my first point um my second point is Misinformation is a term that we have to use and I have to use, but I roll my eyes at it because misinformation has existed before it became a problem for white men and white women wanting to get into office. Misinformation was stereotyping and accusing black boys of being thugs and doing photos in the name of charities or villages in Kenya of pot bellies and flies. Like that, that for me is misinformation around how you're portraying countries back home. But we have to deal with the word, but we can challenge it later. I, I feel like we should be saying what it is at the crux of it, which is white supremacy. It's tech white supremacy made to, put, made to help white supremacy exist, to earn money and to, 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 to organize and to, to, and to grow. Um, and which is why I agree that we need a public health approach to tackling online abuse, to, doubt, to deal with the deficit in education around gender equality, around racism, racism and around all other is isms that are growing at the moment in populist society. If we don't tackle public education, public health education, um, in terms of the root causes of why people join radical groups online, belief, misinformation, etc., as well as understand how what happens when somebody is abusive online, we will only just be putting plasters on the issues. So we're seeing at the moment an increase in people being sentenced in the UK for, for online abuse. I think uh, we need a rule of law, we need regulation, which I'm gonna come to in my final point. Um, but I don't understand at the moment, especially after Black Lives Matter, how sentencing somebody to six months in prison for abusive comments is going to address the issue of online abuse. It's only going to send more people to prison. And I, I just don't know how effective prison is when you've got things like transformative justice and restorative justice, which could be principles that are still centering the victim or the survivor rather than this pipeline to prison. Um, and then lastly, I think in terms of helping the global south, and this is not again like the West helps the, at least to help the south, global south, but I think there could be funding available um, and the UN could lead this around um, a playbook. So the playbook of glitch, all the mistakes that I've made as being this accidental CEO that didn't have no clue what I was doing, don't make the same mistakes as me. Um, contacts that we've made, campaigns that we've had to run. How do we give you that playbook so that you can start from the same level-ish and then press ahead further than, than us. And, that, and I think that is with other organizations uh, across Europe and across um, the US. A, a playbook could be one tangible thing that um, CSW um, uh, commit to. And I'm gonna end on regulation because at the moment we're going through that in the UK, we've got something called the Online Harms Bill, which is meant to be regulating tech companies. It sounds great, right? Duty of care on tech companies. We've seen Europe do something similar with the Digital Services Act. But there's no mention of women. <laughs> there's no mention of women when you're defining harm. We're defining harm for children, you're defining harm for terrorism, you're defining harm in terms of algorithms, but you're missing women yet again. And it's taken us 18 months for us to be able to host a round table for women rights groups from diverse backgrounds who are all about intersectionality. So women disabled groups, women from trans, sorry, LGBTQI and trans communities to come together to meet with somebody from um, DCMS, so our Department for Digital, to talk about the online harms white paper. So there's all, it's all good and well for us to talk about regulation and a standard in which an independent person can regulate tech companies. But if it's going to be made, made up of ex-tech bros who now feel guilty and do a Netflix series called Social, Social Dilemma to kind of wash their sins away, now become part of the regulator, we're not going to solve the issue. We don't define harm from women and intersectionality. We're never making the online space safe for women because the most vulnerable, most minoritized are not going to be safe online. Thank you, Shay. And in fact, um, one of our participants, Lucina Demeco, who's here, and you're very welcome, Lucina. Um, I think Christina has shared one of your reports a moment ago to everybody, and you make the comment that according to a recent analysis from the Economist Intelligence Unit, over 90% of women interviewed in Africa, Latin America, and the Middle East experienced online attacks with misinformation and defamation as the most common strategy. 
Um, I, I think I want to now bring Emma back in again. Um, there is also a question um, from Lucina about the role of philanthropy in tackling um, this problem, Emma, and I thought that would be a good one for you to take on. And then I'm just going to invite again all of our participants, please, if you do have a question you'd like to share, please do put it in the chat. Our um, panellists would love to engage in conversation with you. I love that you throw me the philanthropy question. It's like, thanks very much. <laughs> no, there's been a bit of a, no, a second coming awakening in philanthropy around this issue. So um, there, in a way, it's wonderful that a class of people who hold a lot of power are starting to realize that this is an issue that needs to be funded and focused on um, and that it's an issue that's global and needs to be funded and focused on in a global way, which is also just a brand new idea. Yeah, maybe like there's just a few. Three. I just got muted. Did I, was my sound bad? No, okay, just an accident. Um, so there, that there's a number that it's not, you can take this on in a country where they sort of experimented with this as like, let's try it in Europe, let's try it in the US. And I feel like there's an understanding that it needs to be addressed in a global way. Um, and there's this very cool thing happening in philanthropy with like operational philanthropy. So this combination of we're gonna have funding, but we're also gonna be involved and, and in the muck with the groups trying to help figure out what tools we need to bring to bear to create change. Um, and so in a way, I feel like more funding, especially more funding for the global piece is really important. There's a lot of focus on the US, um, which I get because the US is where these companies are headquartered. If you're gonna move on antitrust or some of those other elements, you've really got to move the US. It's an expensive market to advocate in. Um, but this understanding that really, when you're fighting these fights, um, sometimes the loudest child in the room is not the one that's gonna solve the problem for you. And so the US may look like the right focus and I think it is an important market to operate in, but that if we started directing more funding to global groups, groups in the global South to be able to create really important precedents of some of the things that have been discussed today, like how we might do content moderation in a way that's equitable, how we might center women in legislation, uh, privacy rights enforcement that might be more robust, how we deal with autocratic governments who are invested in this kind of disinformation network, that those things can be piloted. They don't have to be piloted in the US or in the EU. They can be piloted in Brazil. They can be piloted in many countries around, piloted in South Africa. Um, and so making sure that we're investing in groups in those spaces, I think is, is really important. And that's what I would request from philanthropy if I had a request. Um, and, uh, but my, I think my number one message on this is like people, I feel like the, that philanthropy is, is ready. You know, I think it's, they're ready to invest deeply and heavily in this. Um, and that is exciting to me and necessary. Um, Shirley, can I add something to that? Of course, go ahead. I, and I, I think that the other piece of investment here is about understanding that the deployment of this technology is itself a colonial model. And so if we're going to have philanthropic investment, we don't want philanthropic investment to simply um, uh, codify more colonial engagements, meaning that we don't want better bad tech. We want tech that's feminist, that's run by feminists in the global south for our countries, which means beyond our advocacy and accountability measures that we're doing to hold these corporate misogynist platforms to the fire, we also want to be able to fund BIPOC, femme and queer and trans um, innovators to build new tech that speaks to the ways that our democracies and our people work. And I think that to me was actually a really powerful thing that I really um, thought a lot about when I was part of this futurist conversation in South Africa, where um, you know so many South Africans that were in that panel when they were learning about um, what was going around with platforms were like, why do we need American technologists? We actually have our own technology scene. Why wouldn't we innovate for how we want to build with each other? And 
And I think that the startup capital that's required for the kinds of innovations in the global south um, is not the same that's available to innovators in the global north. And what we need is not just new technologies in terms of algorithms, we need innovations related to the business model of tech. Because fundamentally, the reasons why we see um, all of these failures related to disinformation and hate speech is because their business models are based on um, making money off these things. And the number one thing when you talk to them is like, ah, there's not a lot we can do about it. And I was like, well, you know, in, in the United States, there was an app called um, the Yo app where these two, these two kids got a million dollars to make an app that just said yo to each other. If they can get money for that, we should be able to fund an entire generation of feminists of color to build the technology that we need for the new internet. And that's really how we get to what Sayu is talking about in terms of equity in this conversation. For us to spend the next 10 years cleaning up um, you know, bad tech created by white cis men is stupid. It's a stupid waste of a visionary generation um, time and money and, and practice. I would much rather give so many of those activists and thinkers training and money to scale up to build their own techs that we can build the feminist internet we deserve. Because fundamentally, our democracies deserve better than this. And we know we are not going to solve the problems of the global south in air conditions rooms, you know, run by white men. That that is that ship is sailed and gone, and they've tanked every you know possibility that they could do. The future belongs to us. And for that to happen, we need investment in a core way that allows us to succeed in creating visionary options, not just okay, let's go with our begging bowl to Facebook. And, and I think that's also the other piece for me is like, we need to be talking seriously about reparations from these corporations. They have destroyed and brought so many democracies to the brink. We don't need to talk to them any further about, you know, their little pittance grants that they try to do to offset their, their massive corporate malfeasance. We need fundamental reparations. If you brought a market to a coup, if you brought a market to genocide, if we are seeing pogroms, if we are seeing women murdered and um, other activists, you know, disappeared for the content that's happening on your platform, we need the money as a response. We need people to be restored because um, you can never repair after such, you know, heinous atrocities, but they are responsible. And I think that I really want to leave people with this idea, you know, when IBM played a role in the Holocaust, there was consequences. And these social media companies are basically playing similar roles in the destruction of many democracies. And women are often the first line of collateral damage on that. And I would say the price of one life is already too much and they need to pay. And we need to be able to create the global movement that can hold them accountable. Yeah. <laughs> Surely I want to add just one thing on top of that, although that was incredibly powerful. Thank you, Samori, for putting it into full context. I think what you're basically saying on this question, and we could all agree with, we're in different sort of in different um, entry points on this, philanthropy and donors need to put their money where their mouth is at this point. And there are several different ways they can do that in the context of how they, they fund. I think we absolutely need the bigger picture strategy that Thamori outlined. But there's also smaller things that we can do. So if you are a research-based you know, entity in, in tech policy and looking at, let's say, inoculation strategies around disinformation, how about funding inoculation strategies for women? You know, the way that we cannot call out lies and pivot to the truth when gender disinformation is at stake. Calling out the lie amplifies the attack against women whenever there is, a, is gender or um, ethnic bias of some sort. Um, that is a powerful tool against correcting. You know, when, when I am in rooms where folks are trying to really understand, you know, what is this kind of gender disinformation and how does it manifest itself? Um, you know, men are not threatened with rape. There is a whole taxonomy understanding of, of how the technology works. So everyone should figure out what is their gender disinformation financing plan 
to add to some type of solution, whether it is helping manage the problem, pushing to larger policy solutions, enabling activists to fly to parliaments where you know they're being asked to testify or where the voice of their participation is missing, um, helping organizations not be captured by big tech, who's trying to put them on various task forces and giving small grants um, and really silencing and buying their, their silence. So, so many things in the funding uh, arena are needed in this next stage. I would just yeah love to add to the point around the way what the way philanthropy works um and going to try and mind my language given where i'm at even though i feel like i'm at home because i am at home but i think um uh glitch and myself didn't get the level of funding that we did until um people cared about a black man dying at the hands of the police in the us at last last year so glitch has been going as an entity for four years we became a charity last february um, we tried fundraising in the women's sector, we tried fundraising in the tech sector because we thought we felt like it was very important to be a bridge of the two. There's capacity building needs to be done for women because we still just uh, fundraise or campaign on a very traditional forms of violence when there needs to be an understanding of the an intersectional approach to violence. And then also the tech space being still full of many, many um, uh, white men having to learn about um, uh, about women's uh, the violence that women women and non-binary people face um we did not get the level of funding and the interest in our work you could say oh it's due to increasing publicity and increasing issues of you know came, people caring about the issues but it was white urgency and white response or white reaction to a black man dying last year that meant that funders were like oh my god we've not been ring fencing 15% of our multi-billion pound uh, fundraising strategy for four or five black women <laughs> and still making them go through the hoops of fundraising that a bigger organization can do, but a very small organization can't. So I just really want to hone on that point around civil society groups want to want to act, want to do something. They shouldn't have to, but they want to. But then the, the second barrier that they face is the philanthropy, not philanthropy world, not understanding the area and still funding the area in a very racist, sexist lines. Um, the other point I want to say is that I think the, the UN has an advantage point that many national countries do not have. The UN have language and agree about agree on intersectionality. They agree on multiple additive combined forms of discrimination. Here in the UK, we don't. Here in the UK at the moment, we have a war, a war on wokeness. We have a deliberate um, um, we have a policing bill that passed yesterday that basically was trying to cap to end um, Black Lives Matter protests. So, so the UN has a real role here in educating member states to sign up to um, not just the commissioning status of women, but from an intersectional lens too. Getting nation na na nation countries and members to understand that we're not talking about women in a homogeneous in a homogeneous uh, way, but in in very much how. Um, it's not just multiple, it's specific. Being a black woman has specific types of abuse different from there being black and a woman. It, 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 and that real understanding is something that the UN definitely can progress on, but is miles ahead than countries like us in the, in the UK. Thank you, Shea, and also Christina for your um, for your comments. I I hope it's okay, um, but um, I'm going to now um, hold on mention one of our participants, Monica Rolong, and um, because Monica, you put a very interesting comment in the chat box. You say you're planning to run for mayor of your city of Cartagena in Colum Colombia but to date you have no Twitter account or Instagram account because even though you know how it is important to have an online presence, you are concerned that it would ruin your political career before it even begins. So um, Monica, I don't know if you want to add anything to that, but I just wanted to share that with our panelists and invite any one of them to respond. Monica, hi, it's great to see you. Um, I, I just thought that was such an important comment that you put in the chat box. I want to draw everybody's attention to it and hear any responses from our panelists. Uh, I don't know if Monica wanted to speak a little bit more about, uh, perhaps I should give you an opportunity to speak. I just wanted to. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I want to say something, of course, I want to give you 
Malika, Malika, we can't really hear you. I don't know if you can um, do anything to improve the sound quality. Can you hear me now? S slightly. It's okay. It's okay. We can go ahead with the sound. When you move closer to your computer, we can hear you better. If you could okay. just speak a little bit louder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, yes, I, I I think it was uh, probably, um, I think it was Say or, or some silly who said that they knew that when they opened their Twitter account or their Instagram, they had to be really intentional about it because they knew and they were aware of the consequences that that could have in their future. Well, that's what's happening to me now. I'm still in the U.S. Um, because of the pandemic and I'm waiting, I'm high risk uh, in terms of my health. So flying for seven hours is no good for me, but I will go back to Colombia. I just graduated from Duke and I'm terrified of thinking about, um, you know, what the consequences will be for my future campaign um, and my future nonprofit that I want to create. If I start going on Twitter and starting like voicing my opinions, and so um, that's why I don't do it because I feel like it can actually ruin me even before I even get to have a message or get a platform of my own, which of course will be a feminist platform based on gender equality. But I'm just like, that's why I want to hear from, uh, from Shay because of the toolkit that might be able to help me. And also someone said that when she was being attacked, she just stood her ground and I don't know how to do that. Like, I don't even, I was like thinking, oh my gosh, how would I stand my ground? How do I even do that? So yeah, I would love to hear from everyone about, you know, my fears and how, if they had those fears, how they were able to overcome them. That would be amazing. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you, Monica. And because of, um, we've only got five minutes left. So just in the interest of time, I'm going to invite Pumzilla first of all, and okay. then um, Shay and anybody else from the panel who wants to um, jump in with just quick remarks. Thank you. Monica, there is absolutely no space that we as women cannot occupy. Um, good luck in your campaign. I would absolutely encourage you to join Twitter. It is a hellhole but it gives you a direct line to voters where they feel they can communicate with you. And as a woman daily, my Twitter account is filled with insults and I use the block button. So do not be afraid of the block button. I think there are great opportunities and kick down that Twitter door and go in there and don't be afraid to use the block button. Um, and there are, ma there are so many great people on Twitter who actually just want to talk to you. And those good voices often um, seem louder than the bad ones. So go in. Ah, oh, so much I want to say. Come along to our workshop. We've we're on a we've just did our last one for International Women's Day for particularly active women. Uh, we're not going to do another one till the till, till the summer, but that still still might work out for you. The toolkit is on there. Is like a imagine if Shayi could be in your room with you and giving you a one hour session around how to stay safe and not make the mistakes that I made. Um, that's what it is. Um, but the things I would draw upon there is um, what I want to say like. The, the, this is the element, this is the worst bit of when you've, when we've raised awareness of online abuse, now people are fearing the online abuse. And I think it's a double-edged sword. I think it's important for women that we've lived experience to talk about the online, online abuse. And we saw it in the UK with an exodus of women not standing for re-election again in 2019 because of online abuse. But then what that happened, what happens because there's been no political tech response to that, more the next generation of women are like i don't want to stand so that that needs to be addressed um the, the yeah so the, my top tips are um in your campaign strategy there needs to be a safety element it's all great having a campaign strategy about post on here and say this and meet this person but if, if safety is not at the is not at the foundation of that then to me it's not a successful campaign it should not be um sold or delivered on delivered uh, on the on on your sacrifice for your self-care and your well-being the second thing that our workshop around digital self-care and the toolkit talks about and i'm writing a book on this very topic is around agency 
there's women women have not been conditioned have been conditioned sorry to not be able to say no to people and be able to set boundaries and so that that issue that is happening offline spirals onto the online space so 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 many women will be like I can't block the resident I can't block the constituent I can't block why can't you what why can, why cannot what why <laughs> if you can't block because you're block, because, block. Of the fear, <laughs> because you can't block because of the fear of backlash mute filter then you don't see it i think also um another thing that somebody people don't talk about um which is why i hope the book does this um what happens when you gain certain number of followers on certain platforms women will tell you when they started reaching the ten thousand follower mark things changed they started becoming added onto lists they started being uh, monitored and surveillance a lot more journalists were following them and so the so that's something to watch for and making sure there's somebody in your campaign team that is dedicated to looking at who is following you and block them i will check who is this bot who is this um uh, i am part i uh, use a, an app called the block party app but um um, which is being which other uh, companies are now um, put, put in as part of their um, their safety um, functionalities, which is something we've been campaigning for years on. But it means I don't see it. It means I don't see and engage with people who do not set up their Twitter accounts um, the way I, I expect them to, which is to verify your email address at, at the very at the very um, least. And the same the same thing I think in terms of people who follow you, don't give them permission to have. It's like having you know your your curtains up and someone can see directly into your bedroom window you wouldn't do that you would have some kind of safety mechanism there to filter out who can have um who can see you and who you're exposed to and the final thing around digital self-care and around boundaries is being clear around what you want to share i think women particularly are forced to kind of convince voters to vote for them and therefore feel the need to overshare more than a man would you never hear about if a man has children you never hear if a man has is with is with a woman or is with a man but women have to show their family women have to show where they live women have to give the story you might not want to because that what might spark abuse that might spark a level of a, a time in your life where you live in your best life in the clubs and you don't want that to be part of your campaign i think it's about women understanding agency online and offline that is going to also push tech companies to provide better better functionalities that support digital self-care Shay, thank you for that that was a lot of information and well done and i just posted your the link to your website in the chat so everybody can go in and check out those resources and um, we're at time now so i want to thank all of our panelists emma thank you so much and um, pumzilla then maury christina um, thank you, and thank you for everybody joining us here today and really engaging in this important conversation. And um, this will be, this has been recorded, and we are going to make it publicly available. And um, please stay in contact with us all. And I think Christina's put her contact information in the chat as well. So please do stay in touch and reach out to us um, to follow up on any of the particular items that we've been discussing today. So thanks again, everybody. Take care and enjoy the rest of the day and a happy St. Patrick's Day to everybody again. <laughs> Bye. Thank you so much. So lovely meeting all of you.